Okay, in vineyards. Okay. Yeah. But mostly weed management. Yeah. Okay. Cool. How about you? Can you tell me a little bit about your experience as well? Yeah, it was similar. Um, I had went and got my uh, uh, private applicator's license through the county. Okay. Um, and do you maintain that? Yes. I, I could have given you hours for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. And is it through uh, what county are we in? Alameda. Or is it through Alameda County or some exterior or like outlying counties? It's through Alameda. Okay. And so you worked on vineyards. Um, I worked as a pesticide applicator for yes. hire. Okay, cool. Ha anybody else have any uh, experience with pesticides? Okay. And so your interest in this class is, I mean, I know you're not here just for me. I know you're here for like the whole semester or the quarter, what have you. So what is your interest in this class? If you guys could, if you think it sort of would help me sort of frame the discussion, I would love to hear that. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, sorry, okay. I will call on you both. So <laughs> don't you worry. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I work for a organic um, winery. Okay. And our, our so our vineyards we're not using pesticides. You know everything by hand. Every, we we do use oils uh, for mm -hmm. spraying. So oil oils are pesticides, but okay. yeah, it's great that you're using oils. It just right. sort of uh, I can make a comment on that, but thank okay. you for providing that. And that's what I, I wanted to find out more about too. So. How to manage pests in, in yeah. a, bu a variety of different ways. We have a vineyard that. manager that, that, you know, does that, uh, does the oil application and everything, but I'm involved with so every other part. You're of out it. there, right? Yeah. You're probably touching foliage and stuff like that as right. well. And pesticides have that applied. I mean, obviously oils are like a, a lower toxicity material, but right. oils do absorb into our skin fairly readily, but they, they are oils. So. I'm not going to downplay it. It's a pesticide. I have to tell you to be cautious. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yes, sir. Can you tell me like what your experience? Just a student now and a winemaker, um, but yeah, in future state, I'd like to spend a lot of time in winery and vineyards, and um, so I'm taking this particular class in order to maybe recognize you know, problems that would really happen or take hold and kind of mitigate them. So you guys are um, sort of like throughout your discussion throughout the quarter, you guys are discussing like vineyard pest management, am, am yep. I yep. right in assuming that? Mm -hmm. So presumably you might be out there scouting vineyards in the future or presently you're in the past and sort of, so um, just, I guess the reason why pesticide safety and like safe use of pesticides come into play is you may or may not apply pesticides now or in the future, but if you're working out in a vineyard, um, chances are you will be exposed to at least some residues of so when I say residues, do you guys know what I mean by that? Can you anybody give me a definition of residue? Leftover material that is still around, even though it's not being sprayed at the moment. Right. It was sprayed, maybe sprayed in oil or um, MC lime sulfur. It's approved for organic production. So uh, you know that was applied, you know, a week ago. But there are still residues of pesticides out on the foliage, um, you don't necessarily know how much because different materials, um, they break down quicker than others, right? Just based on their chemical properties. So there could be residues, just leftover materials and, and you know, walking into a vineyard one time and touching foliage and not having gloves on. I don't know, just residues, probably not gonna hurt you. It's really long, like um, uh, chronic exposure is sort of more um, what we worry about, I mean, acutest exposure is obviously a problem as well, but I think chronic exposure is much more common and just sort of like under the radar. So that's why I like to talk about pesticides and protecting yourself and stuff. So anyways, I'll get started. Let me see what, did I, how many have applied pesticides? So is it just my two right here who have applied pesticides? Okay. Uh, yes, you guys work in fields or will in the future potentially work in fields where pesticides are applied. So just sort of a note to you guys as you uh, continue on with your studies and perhaps go into the world, um, pesticides may have been applied where you're working. And so just sort of be cognizant, you have the right to ask questions about what's been applied and um, you know, just sort of uh, be kind of aware of what's been applied and, and when it isn't safe to go in. And do you need any personal protective equipment or anything? So, um, so I know you guys are all talking about pest management. You probably talk about IPM a lot. And so 
how do you think that pesticides fit into an integrated pest management program? But you know, before I ask that question, let me just see what your what your definition of integrated pest management is. What do you what do you think that means? Using but did you have? Yeah, I'll come to think of it as uh, using pe uh, pesticides as a uh, last resort, and uh, see if there are other decisions that you can make before you automatically bring up pesticides. So then what are some things that you would do to determine a pesticide before you use a pesticide? What are some other... I could it remediate the problem with, uh, say, another means, like finding, you know, with the cause of these ants being, you know, on my foundation, you know, what is it that's attracting the ants, or what, what, what have I set up so the ants are going to be there? Yeah, so like when you have ants inside your house, for example, because or it's a common you, problem, right? right? It's probably you can caulk the cracks or something like that. So you're not going to get rid of the ants altogether, but you can keep them out of where you don't want them. But I would use pesticides before I suffered a loss, too, whether it's in the field or at my house. So. Yeah, so it's, it's a, like sort of like this decision-making process, right, integrated pest management. So you start with planning and trying to prevent pests. So you have to know field history. You have to know what pests are potentially going to arrive or potentially already there, especially in terms of like soil-borne pests. And then you have to work, you know, within your system to try and prevent that. And some of our preventative measures are like cultural, or uh, like crop rotation, right? We don't, you probably don't rotate crops very much in grapes, right? So that's just not an option for you because you've got this perennial crop and, you know, nothing is going to be as economically um, viable probably as another grape crop whenever you're uh, replanting. I don't know if you would do a whole scale field replant or if you do a little at a time or just remove uh, the diseased vines or what have you. So um, this is, I don't know why this, sometimes it shows up better than others, but I think of integrated pest management as like this puzzle, right? So you've got all, you've got predictive tools, right? So we've got weather forecasting because we know like with powdery mildew, we know that's, if the weather conditions aren't right for powdery mildew, you might have, um, you might have a host plant, you might have the pathogen, but you also have to have sort of like the environmental conditions there as well. So we've got predictive tools to help us determine um, if these pathogens or other pests are going to be present, right? And so pest sampling, we've got forecasting, we've got thresholds. And I, I presume that, so this is not my area, it's just, you know, I sort of fit into this puzzle and so I'm not gonna talk very much about it, but you know, there are all these ways to predict pests and try to, sort of prevent them or work around them, right? And then we have different control tactics. So we've got the pre and the post, right? So once our pests arrive, we have pesticides that we can use. This is biorational, but that means things like biopesticides or even organically approved pesticides and then conventional pesticides, right? Um, but then we have like uh, things like uh, cultural or host plant resistance and then biocontrol. So there's and this isn't an exhaustive list, right? So pesticides are here and they're part of the puzzle. But if you're only using, for example, pest sampling, and then your pest sampling shows that you've got this, you know, economic um, level of pest infestation and you do nothing about it, that, that doesn't help you at all. So like none of these pieces of the puzzle make sense on their own or they don't do the job all on their own, right? Because if you think of this as an actual puzzle, so like if it were a puzzle of like Yosemite, right? This really nice landscape. So you've got El Capitan and you see it, right? When it's all put together, you get the picture, it works for you, right? It's really beautiful. But if you just had like one little piece and it was just brown or like different shades of brown, it's like, what is this even? It doesn't make sense by itself. It doesn't do the job by itself, right? So it's. That's how I see IPM, okay? So in pesticides. So pesticides are a little part of that. And then my part of pesticides is, if you're gonna apply a pesticide, do it in the right way. So let's protect human health and the environment uh, while we're making these pesticide applications, right? I'm not here to advocate for or against pesticides. I'm just here to say, if you're gonna do it, let's not you know, cause any adverse harm um, to humans or the environment or wildlife or what have you while we're doing this, okay? It's a fact of life, pesticides are used every day, everywhere. You know, whether they're oils or 
could be something like paraquat or you know things that are um, super acutely toxic. Pesticides are always used, and so um, it's good when we're sort of in that environment to use them appropriately and to make really good sound decisions. Okay, so how are people exposed to pesticides? Um, I'll tell you what I think. Okay. I think these are the ways that we, as humans, right, can be exposed to pesticides through our food or, want, or the things that we eat and drink, right? Dietary exposure is really what this should say, okay? Um, but then there's occupational exposure, so that's sort of like when we're out there either working in the fields, whether or not we're applying pesticides, right? Because pestic if pesticides are applied in those uh, fields, we could be exposed. And then through water, uh, whether we work or live in the fields or not, there are pesticides in ground and surface water resources, okay? And then pesticides are also in the air, okay? I mean, it's not like, I don't wanna like make you fearful, like you're not gonna walk outside and be like, oh my God, there's pesticides everywhere, right? So uh, they're, they're, we're in California, so you're like super overprotected. <laughs> so, but there's lots of intense agriculture that goes on in here. So there's lots of monitoring that also, monitoring and mitigation that goes, goes on as well. And so today, I don't wanna talk so much about dietary exposure because that's really sort of like in the hands of the regulatory agencies to determine what level of pesticides is, people can be exposed to over the course of their lifetime. They've got these really extensive risk assessments. And this, the only thing that we can do is make different food choices. But I'm not a nutritionist, so I don't want to talk that much about food choices, right? I mean, I could talk about food all day long because I love to eat, but I'm not going to focus on this. These are other things that we can, that I like to focus on. So, this is what I sort of want you to do. You can work by yourself, you can work the person next to you, or telepathically communicate to whomever. So, this is, this is just exactly what I have up there. I want you to just sort of brainstorm, because I don't want to tell you everything, because I feel like you guys collectively probably know a lot more about, I don't know what's on that, a lot know, know a lot more about pesticides than I do. Watch out you put all your brain power together. So I want you to think, you could choose one of these little four things, or all of them, or whatever, and think about how pesticides, thank you, you're very... You're a very generous individual. Um, think about how pesticides get into the air. Think about how pesticides get into the water. Or how people who work in the fields can be exposed to pesticides. Sort of like the mechanism. Like, how is it that pesticides get into the water? Give me some, could be terms or scenarios or something like that.
Well, they say fifteen normally. Yeah, next year, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm gonna buy them. I just got wind. Uh, I'm supposed to do them all. Yeah. Just pick one. Two, two as much as all. Like it's like a oh the string. Oh, string. Uh, string. Yeah. 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 Anybody? 
guess what is the difference between those pesticides? Solubility? Yes. So which one is soluble? The one that's like grabbing onto the soil particles or the one that's going down? Yeah, this is so, more soluble. Not that many pesticides are actually like truly soluble, right? But these are pesticides that are more soluble than that, and they can move with the soil water, right? That goes through the pore space, and it just moves excessively when there's excessive water. Great, that's great. So anybody else have anything else up here? Yes. The uh, occupational exposure and uh, not wearing the proper PPE. Oh, can you tell us what PPE stands for? Personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so things like long sleeve shirt or a coverall, gloves, um, protective eyewear, and uh, sometimes we have to wear different not tennis shoes, right? A respirator. Uh, sometimes a respirator. Exactly. So that that is a good way to get occupational exposure is not wearing the proper PPE or not wearing it appropriately. Like if you're wearing glasses on your head, not super protective. That's that is a common violation that they find. Um, among pesticide applicators. Uh, anybody else want to tell me what you put on your paper? Uh, it's on the surface of the food that we eat. Okay. Also, the animals that we eat getting exposed to pesticides because they live in the environment. Okay, so obviously food is sprayed with pesticides, right? Because that's what we're growing. And, and so we'll, we'll skip over that because I think that's sort of, we know that. Um, tell me, so how, so what animals are you thinking of? Like cows, cows pigs? And, yeah, anything that Fish. Cows, chickens, fish. I mean, those are the ones. So pigs. do we apply pesticides directly to the cows and the pigs? No, but we apply it to the environment that they live in, and then they eat that grass or whatever they're eating. Right, so if they're... Is exposed or, to pesticides. Yeah, so if we give them grain or corn silage, right? Yeah, just throw it on the pesticides. ground, right? They'll eat off the ground. But like, <laughs> the things that we feed to them, have, we have purposely put pesticides on them so that they would grow and we could get, you know, a little good yield on them. So yeah, so it, it, it is, they do incorporate into their tissues. Um, that is all part of like EPA's risk assessment when they make decisions on um, pesticide rates and registering pesticides. But yes, absolutely, it's important to know that we can't just, you know, like, oh, it's just hay, we can put whatever pesticides on it we want. No, because animals eat that hay and then we eat those animals and it's really important to uh, uh, to follow the label on all of those items but um, even wildlife um, like sometimes wildlife is exposed incidentally or um, like they're not the target of the pesticide application but then they are they are exposed to pesticides particularly in water right well, that's deer the, rodents you know all those that that's right that's right yeah so go to um, so things that eat rodents, because like we typically are trying to kill the rodents. Well, right? I mean, uh, okay. I mean, our pests that go to the vineyards, you know, and we'll eat those like deer and uh, uh, groundhogs and those. Uh, so who, who's eating what? So the deer is eating what? The foliage? Yes. Okay, got it, got it. So we can expose wildlife in that way, right? And then some people eat deer. So it's just, um, it's good to like sort of think of like this whole, um, biomagnification or bioaccumulation, or like, it's really just like, I don't want to say the circle, but, but we eat animals often and those animals might be eating pesticide residues, so it's not just in our produce, right? So we can be exposed to pesticides in those ways. So anyone have anything for air? Drift. Drift? So tell me what, yes, I should say yes, and then I should say, uh, tell me how drift happens, or tell me a little bit more about drift. Um, when applying a pesticide, if it's uh, like a foliar pesticide, wind can carry the pesticide a distance away from your crop. Yeah, so we are spraying. I mean, drift can happen with uh, uh, water, like sprays, like uh, droplets, but it can also happen like even with like sulfur dust or any other kind of dust, but it's more typical of uh, sprays, right? And so we're trying to get it here but it moves somewhere else because something that we've done not exactly on par. So and we'll talk about drift a, lot, a little bit more. So like when, some, when drift happens, so the pesticide that we're intentionally spraying is going where we don't intend it to go. So it can travel in the air, it will land either, could land on water resources, it could land on people, um, it could land, you know, 
on you know any neighboring property. It could land on, on anywhere. 